good morning and uh, welcome back to uh, this uh, last session of, uh, of the workshop. I will ask you to uh, come in and, and take your seat. Time is precious, so we would need to we we need to uh, start this uh, session. So we're back in uh, in in plenary after the uh, uh, breakout sessions uh, yesterday afternoon and uh, and and, uh, and this morning. The the idea of uh, of, of this uh, session is to give a, a, an opportunity um, to uh, to review together uh, the outcomes of the breakout uh, uh, sessions um, and have a, a feel for uh, the uh, conclusions and recommendations made from those uh, sessions. So um, we will uh, we will go through each uh, of, uh, of them and ask uh, the, the rapporteurs of, uh, of those sessions uh, to present uh, those, uh, those conclusions. Uh, for session one, uh, I will ask uh, Steve Parnell to, uh, to come and, and uh, give us a quick presentation. I think it is important that we, we stick to very short, sharp presentations, making sure that we have time for uh, an exchange after that. Uh, questions and uh, and uh, exchange with the floor. Uh, you've got 15 minutes. Well, less is even better. Hello. Yeah. Um, so we we had a our, our breakout session was on surveillance and detection for xylella. Uh, so we had a very wide-ranging uh, discussion. I'd like to thank everyone for their, their participation in this. Um, the session was about uh, surveillance and <coughs> detection in the EU. So throughout the potential establishment area of the EU, um, surveillance for early detection um, of further outbreaks are obviously incredibly important for effective containment and control. So to actually have a chance of um, uh, controlling something or eradicating, uh, we have to detect it at a very early stage and surveillance is, is crucial for that. Um, so one of the main um, themes around that is the, the importance of clear and detailed documentation of survey and, and sampling methods, standardized detection methods in, uh, across the EU, uh, and surveillance manuals in common reporting procedures. So our remit was to deal with the um, knowledge gaps and research priorities um, as they pertain to surveillance and detection. And we identified four uh, discussion points to frame uh, the discussion around. The, the first was on why do we need surveillance and what are the related research needs. So the an answer obviously depends on the question. So how we conduct surveillance really depends on why we are, we are doing it. So we tried to investigate the different reasons um, for that we, we carry out surveillance. And some of them are identified here. So uh, in terms of our contingency planning, delimiting areas at risk, um, identifying appropriate site of sanitary measures and providing information about vectors um, and, the, and the bacteria. So really, it, it, um, why you're doing surveillance is, is going to be different for different regions, so different parts of the EU, because everyone is facing different situations. And it depends on what, it, what the incursion stage is that you're, you're facing. So um, to start with, if you're, you, know, you want to know, is it here yet? Um, so yeah, that would be conducting surveillance for early detection. Once you, it is present in an area, then you want to know, well, where is it? How many cases are there? How bad is it? Um, and then also you might conduct surveillance because um, you've conducted some sort of eradication. You want to know, was that successful? So you, you conduct some surveillance. You don't find anything. Is it really not there or, or could you have missed it? 
Um, so there are those real, really sort of management-led reasons to do um, surveillance, but we also do it to try to understand uh, more about the, the problem. So there is targeted surveillance and there is more broad random surveillance to, to try to understand uh, the problem and to inform better understanding of epidemiology and the vector dynamics. So once we've established why the specific purpose for a survey, that then informs, well, what and where do we need to perform our surveys? So how can we target surveys to specific rare areas? So to areas of um, high risk. Um, surveillance is very expensive, so we want to put our resources uh, in a targeted way. Um, so how do we uh, target areas of high risk and of economic and cultural importance? How do we uh, distribute our survey effort across um, the different pathways that we face? Um, and we have surveillance in the wider environment. We have surveillance in nurseries and trade networks, uh, as well as entry points, so ports um, and uh, uh, trade networks. There's also, we also discussed, our third discussion point was on how and when to perform surveillance. Um, and the, the research needs to identify the best methods and the appropriate timing of our surveillance efforts. So here we were looking at uh, the detection identification techniques, um, the standardized and harmonized surveillance and detection methodologies and reporting procedures, protocols and guidelines for sharing data, um, particular real-time real data um, as the epidemic is, uh, epidemics are unfolding. Um, and developing uh, shared databases. So how do we do that? So how do we share information across various stakeholders uh, and researchers? Um, determining sa sampling effort. So how much is sufficient for detection? So if we look at a certain number of sites and we don't find anything, what is the probability that it's uh, really not there or could we have missed it? Do we need to look at 10 sites or 100 sites, 1,000? What, uh, what is an appropriate sampling effort? Also, how do we time surveillance efforts? So we have to think about the life cycle of the vector, um, seasonality and symptom expression, perhaps, uh, to give us the best chance of, of detection. So. We had a, a, a sort of wide-ranging discussion around these, uh, these various points. Obviously, it's a very big topic. Um, and what we did was to, during the session, was to try and capture the different thoughts going around the discussion during the discussion, but also we asked participants to write post-it notes to capture what they thought were the, the most uh, important points. And uh, we did that by separating the points along those that relate to um, planning surveillance, those that relate to conducting surveillance, and the, then the use of surveillance results. Uh, and you can, I think it's chopped off a bit on the side here, but then we then uh, structured that by the target. So the first row here is the pathogen, the second is the vector, the third one here is plants, and then the final category were um, those that sort of spanned across pathogen vector and, and host. So perhaps if I, if I go through some of them, so um, in terms of the, the planning stage, um, really this was about enhanced detection methods. Um, so obviously we need better, more sensitive, quicker and more cost-effective ways of detecting the pathogen. And we also have to think about how we deploy those methods. So where do we, where do we put them? So, um, and, and how do we integrate use of multiple um, detection methods to, for this overall goal of trying to de detect uh, the pathogen? Um, so there's our, those considerations on the side of how improving our ability to detect the pathogen, 
but we also need information because the path on in terms of how well how good the pathogen is at evading detection. Um, so a big consideration there for surveillance and for detection in particular is asymptomatic, the asymptomatic period of hosts. So understanding for the particular hosts that you're facing, what the asymptomatic period is, has an influence on what detection methods we might deploy, and it has an influence on what we can conclude from um, a surveillance program about um, the incidence and distribution of the disease. So understanding this asymptomatic period is, is crucial for um, better surveillance and, and detection. In terms of the, the vector, um, a big unknown is the long distance and natural dispersal. And that has a really big impact, obviously, on um, surveillance and how we conduct it. Because if we find one case, how does that inform where, where we look next? So we need to understand about m more information on vector dispersal dynamics to, to help us to inform that. We also, you can sample ve uh, host populations, but you can also look at the vector population. Um, surveillance is expensive, so I think there's a consideration of, well, how much resource do you look, put into looking at the vector populations versus the host population? And again, that, that feeds back into why you're, why you're conducting um, surveillance. And there, of course, there's a, a big information gap in terms of identifying what the relevant vectors are. So what should we be looking at or trying to trap in the first place? In terms of the, the host plants um, for planning surveillance, use of GIS, epidemic models, to try to identify risk factors is, is important to try and target surveillance efforts so that we have the highest detection uh, probabilities for the, the, the lowest costs. Um, we need accurate host maps, so in some areas, uh, so for example in Italy, it may be fairly well known what the olive distribution is, but what about other hosts, alternative hosts, how abundant are they and where are they? We need that information in order to, to direct our, our survey. Um, and to prioritize our survey, we need to know about the susceptibility um, of these, these different hosts. In terms of this bottom category here, which is uh, points that cover everything really, something that came out was the, and I've mentioned it earlier, is the need for a, a clear survey purpose. So really the, that um, you know exactly why you're conducting surveillance because that influences how you should be conducting um, surveillance. Harmonized plans uh, and information. Um, so that uh, we can interpret the information that's coming out of sur surveillance. It's important that people are doing similar things and recording, uh, recording that. And obviously communicating with um, stakeholders because growers, members of the public all have a, a, um, a role in um, reporting and, and detecting disease. So uh, that also ties in with um, you know, what existing efforts are out there and then how does that inform where, how we might conduct more active surveillance. In terms of, uh, so conducting surveillance, so this is really how, you, how you're doing it. Um, so you have a plan in place now, how, what are you going to do? So it's about using um, practical tools for detection and diagnosis. Um, using things like remote sensing for early detection. Um, so research to try to look into how can we use remote sensing for detecting asymptomatic um, uh, infection, because it, which has uh, a big influence on this sort of coverage and our probability to um, pick out new disease foci. It can also be used to better target or lead um, surveillance efforts, so to help us to identify suspicious areas that we can then do um, ground inspection on. Using critical, identifying critical sample sizes for diagnostics. Um, so 
how, how many samples do we need to take to really have a sufficient probability uh, of detection? That's crucial um, for sampling. In terms of the, the vector, the timing of the sampling with the, the life cycle of the vector, um, using um, available vector abundance and distribution maps, and appropriate trapping and identification methods. Um, so ensuring that there is appropriate uh, entomological um, expertise available for identification. In terms of uh, the host plants, obviously there are multiple levels or that we would conduct surveillance on. So we're thinking about um, how do we sample individual trees or plants? How do we sample plantings or the orchid scale? And then at the landscape scale, um, how do we select sites to inspect? And also, how do we do sampling in nurseries and trade networks? Um, again, in terms of the all categories, going back to this, uh, the what is the appropriate sampling effort? Um, clear and detailed protocols for sampling it and data recording. And interacting with all the various stakeholders um, and M MPPOs. In terms of how we can use surveillance results, this is what, uh, broadly what we came up with. So uh, obviously we can use them to inform more accurate disease incidents and distribution maps. So that gives us a better understanding of what the problem is, but it also gives us clues about the epidemiology. Um, so that feeds back in, into research um, and risk assessment. Similarly with the vectors, we can use the results to get a better idea of vector abundance. Uh, and distribution and to in, inform um, the biology of what are the, the appropriate vectors. So there's a role there in surveillance in providing better information. Um, also it feeds back into regulation of um, the possible pathways, um, transmission mechanisms from plants to plants and so on. And in terms of the, the, just the final category here, um, we can use surveillance to evaluate the effectiveness of risk reduction options. So again, though, we have to think about what the, when, we, when we're planning surveillance, if that is the goal, we need to think about that in terms of because it influences how we would conduct surveillance. Um, so a targeted, a targeted surveillance will lead them to perhaps more efficient management options, but we also need surveillance which is broader in scale, more random, if we want to do this sort of evaluation of risk reduction options. Um, harmonizing and targeted data sharing and reporting. So making data available to relevant stakeholders and also to um, researchers, um, interacting with the different players. And feeding back information into epidemic models. So uh, that relates also to better understanding, but feeding information into models, epidemic models, which can then be used to uh, test out more effective surveillance strategies. So um, this is really a, is a sort of circular, um, a circular thing. So these are just some of the sum summary points that we made in a, in a sort of short period of time. We have more extensive notes that we've made during the discussions um, that will go into the, the final report. And I'll just uh, thank everyone that participated uh, in the discussion again. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Steve. Maybe you can stay there for, uh, uh, for, 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 the, for the discussion. Uh, we see that uh, this uh, surveillance uh, uh, issue is a very important one. Uh, I think the presentation uh, has emphasized the importance of uh, a, a clear understanding of uh, of the objectives of uh, of the surveillance and and I see I think we we've heard uh, the plea for uh, for uh, uh, risk based uh, uh, surveillance. Obviously, this is a, a fairly horizontal uh, uh, topic that that has touched on uh, on uh, the vector, the plants, and uh, and um, and the bacterium. So there may be some overlaps uh, between uh, between the the breakout uh, uh, groups. Um, the floor is open for questions, clarifications, no, <laughs> please. You mentioned um, a feedback mechanism of please, some kind. Please, please, um, use the microphone, ah, and, and again, uh, your. Yeah. This is uh, Alexander Purcell uh, from California. 
and I, uh, you mentioned the feedback, and obviously that's important. For example, uh, you find some trapping method for vectors is ineffective, so you need another method. How, what are, any discussion of the details of how that's going to be done, or who's going to determine those details? So you mean the, the details of how the feedback mechanism? Yes. I mean, in principle, yeah. it's a great idea, but how are actually going to ensure that happens? Yeah. We, we didn't, uh, I mean, we identified that as a research gap, but we don't have any solutions to that, or we didn't have an in-depth discussion about the, the solutions for that. But I, I think we should, we'd sort of shine a spotlight on that and that we need to think about how that would actually be done, because I think it is a, an important point. Um, but yeah, we identified that there is this 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 feedback, um, which I think is important, and that we can get a lot of information from surveillance. So it helps us with targeting. But uh, if we store the data in the right way, uh, we record absence data. Often, absence data or negative results are thrown away. Um, but that can be very important for understanding, for making predictions of est estimating populations, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I think it's a it's an important point how that would actually be done. Giuseppe, you want to elaborate on that? Uh, yes, I think this is really an important point because uh, this data, the data collected in surveillance, both positive and negative, are very important from progressing the knowledge on the disease epidemics. Uh, so somehow this data, we should think about how to make them uh, accessible to everyone for studying. Uh, to the researcher working on epidemiology, not only. So, as you said, it's a circular tool because it's by doing survey, you produce uh, uh, results that can be used by research. And researcher epidemiology can give information on how to best conduct surveillance, but we need to find a way to, to have this communication and to make this data accessible. Yes, please. Thank you. I am uh, Ioannis Stavrule, I'm working for the Greek NPPO, and what I would like to say is that uh, sharing information from the surveillance should be, shouldn't be so difficult because every member state has a, a national laboratory that usually uh, gathers all the information of the positive and negatives of the surveillance, and also this is communicated uh, to the EU Commission, so it should be we can establish a mechanism that uh, uh, this information is distributed if we think about it. it. It shouldn't be so difficult to do it. Okay. Yes. Well, I have a general question. As, as you mentioned, Frank, th there are many intercept, uh, intersections between the breaking groups. How are we going to handle this? How are we going to, to identify the topics which are transversal and uh, how are you going to handle this? I think one thing we, we need to make sure is that in this exercise uh, we don't lose any uh, inf inf information. So I would prefer that we duplicate rather than, uh, than losing uh, uh, information. I think that for this, uh, for this uh, uh, part of, uh, of, of the discussion we should concentrate on uh, the specificities of surveillance and not entering into uh, details of, um, of uh, uh, specific aspects on the host or, 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 or vectors. I think we are having a very important uh, uh, conversation now that is uh, the collection of data, the sharing of data. Um, that is uh, extremely important and, and this is probably a conversation that, uh, that will uh, uh, continue. And I think it's to be expected that we will find overlap, and it's a good thing that we do find overlap because it, it identifies how this can be taken forward rather than keeping all, all of these issues in separate categories. And the whole purpose of this workshop is integration. Any other questions or, or requests for clarification for this uh, first uh, uh, group? Yes. Uh, Tania Dreva from Slovenia. Uh, you mentioned several different layers uh, of sampling to get as much data out of it, uh, out of the samples as possible. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether you've also included 
uh, time and spatiotemporal distribution of bacteria in plants. This is something that has been very useful in other systems. So for example, looking through the season, different plant parts to really find the point in the season and in the plant where the possibility of detecting the pathogen if it's present is the, uh, has the highest probability. And if you can uh, um, advance this a bit to do it in a quantitative way that is comparable, this also feeds then into epidemi epidemiology studies. So I know this was not the, the main aim of this group, but again, it's a correlation or used also in other, useful for other fields. Okay, so, so my understanding is that the, the question is about uh, targeting surveillance at points in the season or points in the year that uh, you have the greatest chance of detecting symptoms because they're more visible. Um, is that? It's not necessarily symptoms. You're okay, so also just the, the concentration the ba of bacteria yeah, okay. or, you know. Yeah, I think that's an important point. Um, so in terms of the temporal aspects, there's how often you um, survey. Um, and if, you, if for early detection in particular, if you're going to detect at an early stage, if it can increase quickly, then you need to, um, you need to sample quite frequently. But then, yeah, there is definitely an important issue of sampling at the, at the right time or maybe targeting most resources at, at the right time. But I think there is also a frequency, um, so how often. Um, so rather than, you know, maybe there's a trade-off in there somewhere, but rather than waiting until the right time appears, you also have to keep looking. So there's, there's probably some, some trade-off there. Thank you. Charles? Just a, a, a very simple question. I don't understand uh, what, what does it mean, uh, GIS? Uh, Sorry, yeah. Okay, so um, GIS is a geographic information system. So it's a way of um, mapping different variables, so mapping host distributions, environmental variables, like climatic variables, that sort of thing. So it's a way of um, looking spatially at the different risk factors. Thank you. Thank you very much. If no more questions, I would propose to move to the session two and, uh, and that uh, Domenico Bosco uh, comes to, uh, to present the, the, the outcomes of, uh, of the discussions in this, uh, in this group. Thank you, Domenico. Again, we, we try to, to stick to a short presentation to allow time for questions and exchange with the floor. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. Uh, how can I? OK. So hello, everybody. Uh, we had a very fruitful discussion in the breakout group two on vector uh, identity, biology, epidemiology, and control. Uh, I don't need to stress the importance of the vectors uh, in the xylella epidemiology spread. And also, uh, we all know that a very deep knowledge of the vectors is needed, is really a key factor in designing new control methods. So uh, these are the main interests expressed by the participants before attending this uh, uh, meeting, these breakout groups. Uh, uh, but we can see that main interests were uh, <coughs> devoted to the identification of vectors and to make clear transmission characteristics. But we can see that at the end of the uh, work, we also we made an exercise uh, in order to prioritize the different research need and results are slightly different, but okay, these are some details of the session composition and these are the, 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 the presentation we had in the working group. Uh, so the discussion points were, ident were based on the topics identified in the briefing notes and uh, now we are going to see more in detail <coughs> the proposal of the breakout groups. 
So, as for what concerns biology and ecology of the potential European vector of Xylella, all the groups agree that an inventory of potential vector species should be done, is a basic step. Uh, some suggestion came out, for example, that reference specimens should be stored under ethanol and made available to everybody for any further purposes, because maybe for uh, genetic studies, for the identification of uh, parasitoids or symbionts and so on. So this is a, 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 a common suggestion. Then there is a need for common survey protocols that should be established uh, at least among ongoing research projects. Uh, <coughs> we don't think that very detailed protocols will be followed by all the, 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 the researchers, but at least sampling methods and data records should be on, the, on this. Uh, the, we should agree on some common method. Then, uh, it was also noted that uh, according to the funded project, there are some gaps in data collection on vectors in the Mediterranean Mediter uh, member states. So we should try to uh, overcome the, uh, and to solve these gaps. But also, uh, we should be able to obtain and to gain information uh, as for what concerned the, the Mediterranean countries, not only from the Mediterranean member states, but also by the other uh, <coughs> countries of the Mediterranean area. Then uh, an important goal <coughs> that should be achieved is uh, the setup of rearing techniques uh, for the Xylella fastidiosa vectors, because uh, these vectors are, or these potential vectors, are poorly uh, known so far and uh, rearing techniques are not established yet and are needed for a high number of different experiments for different purposes. And also the uh, efficacy of the currently used sampling methods have been questioned and therefore uh, there is a need for the evaluation of the, of the efficacy of new alternative sampling methods. Then, uh, for what concerns the biology, reproductive biology and life history should be investigated into the detail. And reproductive biology is really a, a key factor in, in the knowledge of, the, of these vectors. And uh, related to the reproductive biology, also the presence of facultative endosymbionts such as Volbachia, but also other uh, endosymbionts, is, uh, is, is an important topic that should be developed. Uh, and another point is the microbiome associated with vector forgat, because this microbiome can potentially interact with the transmission process. Uh, and of course, we think that the feeding behavior of the vector species on different host plants uh, is also of key importance. And now we have good technology to face this problem. Uh, as for the ecological studies, we all agree that this investigation should be targeted to the whole agroecosystem and not only to the crops, because the epidemiology of xylella is not only a matter of vectors or of plants, but it's a matter of uh, uh, complex interaction, and we cannot focus only on the vector part. So we have to characterize the different agroecosystem agro at different scales, landscape, agroecosystem, so, or simply the field crop. And we have to estimate the relative abundance of the vector species, but also the description of the population dynamics of the vector species is, is mandatory. And also a very important point is to investigate and to describe the host plant preferences for feeding, for egg laying of the different vector species. And of course, another uh, uh, topic that was suggested is the identification of non-host plants because we have to deal with very polyphagous vectors uh, that can feed on a wide variety of plants, but it is maybe possible to identify some plants that are uh, non-host and then can be used for uh, control uh, method. 
uh, as for the uh, vector identification, uh, the first step, uh, and uh, not only vector identification, but also uh, make clear their role in the disease epidemiology, uh, we agree that the first basic step is the accurate record of the disease infection progress. The pattern of disease progress possibly followed plant by plant can provide very useful information on the role of the vectors. And also it's very important to identify the factors driving epidemics beside the presence of infected vectors because we have a situation in which infected vectors are associated with epidemics and others in which infected vectors are, are not associated with epidemics but only with the spotted presence of the, of the pathogen and of the disease. Uh, of course, and also we identify field transmission experiments with sentinel plants that can be used as spy plants uh, visited by the vector is a, a good option to study the role of the vectors, as well as is mandatory to identify the source of inoculum for the vectors in the different agroecosystem. Uh, this is really important, otherwise we cannot make clear the epidemiology of the disease. And also, since these, uh, special, especially the spittle bugs, they are very long-living insects, we were wondering if infectivity is actually lasting for all the life or not. So this is a point that can be developed. And uh, vector transmission studies with the... Uh, Xylem sap feeding specialist, of course, must be carried out with the different uh, strain, isolates of the, uh, that uh, are found in Europe. Uh, another important point uh, that is related to the vector role in the spread of the pathogen to other areas is the, the, the spread, the movement capability of the vectors. So, we individuate the monitoring of active and passive dispersal capacity of vectors as a, an important point, both with studies at the short range active dispersal that can be carried out with techniques that are listed here, or long range dispersal that can be also studied with molecular markers. And then also a, a, a point which is relevant to the risk assessment is the description of the human-assisted dispersal capacity of the vector. As for the vector management, we all agree that the control programs should be based on the deep knowledge of vector ecology, on soil management, vegetation management, farming practices, evaluation of the efficacy and side effect of insecticide for vector control in both organic and conventional agriculture. We have to remind that these insects were not considered as a pest until very recently, so we have no data on their susceptibility to uh, insecticides. But also we have to identify uh, and to rate the impact of natural enemies such as predators, parasitoids, pathogens. And finally, we ended up in a quite a, a nice innovative idea of IPM, can I, I try to define as a vertical IPM approach in which we should combine multiple control tools to be able to achieve uh, a high suppression of the population because when we talk about vectors, uh, we have to uh, consider that the population threshold that we can uh, accept in the field is very low. So to achieve such a low uh, population level, we have to use uh, several different control tools because there is not a single control tools that will allow to obtain uh, an effective suppression. So all the, the previously described uh, 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 co um, control methods should be integrated, including the inoculum re removal. So we also spent some time in uh, discussing how remote sensing aerial image analysis to monitor disease progress can help epidemiological studies, but also the awareness raising and citizen science to collect data on vector presence. It can also be uh, applied because uh, uh, people can be trained 
quite easily to identify, for example, spitter bugs, and some data can be uh, collected also uh, in this way. Finally, we, we discuss how can you, EU scientists best catch up with ongoing research elsewhere in order to avoid repeating research already done or, pre, or benefit from previous work and uh, optimize interaction. So uh, we have some suggestion. Of course, systematic reading of literature before conducting new experiment sharing information and data via uh, online database that include also ongoing research programs and provide forum for international meeting on xylella vector researches. At the end of our, at the very end of our work, uh, <coughs> we made the exercise of prioritize the research need in terms of gross category and we uh, prioritize what is important and what is urgent. And the output uh, that you can see in this slide show that uh, the participant consider uh, the knowledge of the geographic distribution of the vector species and, the, um, and also the ecology of the vector species as well as the control as very important factors. But in terms of uh, urgency, uh, the identification of the vector, of the species as a vector, and uh, the, the control and the, uh, and the control method and the, and, the bio and the knowledge of the biology are uh, rated as the most important uh, goal. And with this, I conclude, and I want to thank all the participants to the breakout uh, session two for their uh, very active uh, and fruitful uh, uh, participation and contribution, and I thank you also for your attention. Thanks, thanks, Domenico. Um, another uh, very rich uh, feedback from, uh, from this, uh, from this uh, group. Um, we see that uh, there's uh, a lot to, to learn about uh, uh, vectors. Uh, I've noted this uh, importance of, uh, of the inventory. Um, also, some similarities there uh, with the, 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 the call for, uh, for sh sharing uh, material and, and, and sharing data, uh, maybe biobanks uh, or, or uh, uh, initiatives of, of, that, um, of that type. And uh, very important, this uh, system, uh, system approach with the, with the different, um, different scales. Um, the the issue of, of, of drivers of epidemics uh, goes beyond the the, uh, the 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 question of the vectors only, but uh, but that's I think uh, another very very nice uh, horizontal uh, uh, issue to to develop. And I think the idea that there is no uh, silver bullet, but that uh, we will have to combine uh, uh, different uh, efforts uh, is uh, is what I note from uh, from your presentation. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Clarifications. Who wants to kick in? Yes. Uh, thank you, Emilio Stefani from the University of Modena and Reggio, uh, Italy. Um, I saw that uh, uh, on vector management, you suggested um, many kinds of interventions in the field. Um, probably somebody would be concerned on the impact on biodiversity, considering the multiplicity of vectors or insects. So if you uh, set up measures to control so many insects present in the environment, it might be that such measures might have a great impact in biodiversity. Okay, first of all, uh, I would like to to stress the fact that uh, control measure uh, won't be targeted against all the xylem set feeder, but a preliminary step will be the identification of the vector or main vector species in, the, in a given agroecosystem. Then I think that the implementation of different uh, control methods 
that can result in a very effective suppression of the target population, uh, not necessarily uh, result in a, in a high impact in terms of biodiversity. Because if we consider uh, measures such as vegetation management and uh, eventually insecticide application, of course, with vegetation management, we we will be able to remove a large part of the population and less insecticide application will be needed. And by applying less insecticides in a way, we will preserve biodiversity. Uh, this is an example, but for sure, uh, when, we, when our goal is to suppress a target population, we will impact to some extent to the biodiversity, but the integration of different control tool, in my opinion, minimize the impact on biodiversity rather than using uh, massively uh, or uh, relying massively on a single control uh, method. That's my thinking, but. Any reaction to, to that? Yes, please. Uh, Gianni Cantele, Copa Cogico, Col Diretti. Um, more than a question, I think uh, a consideration uh, in order I represent the, the, the growers. Um, especially in Puglia where we have uh, the, the problem uh, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a big, uh, big situation and uh, I, I think that we have to react uh, um, using a defensive uh, system against the, uh, um, the, the vector, but we also have a problem uh, considering the uh, organic um, uh, production, uh, which is quite high, quite huge in, uh, in uh, that region. So now we have uh, the problem to, um, uh, to find a solution to control the vector, but at the same time to guarantee the uh, possibility uh, for, the, um, for the producer to continue to produce uh, organic, uh, organic olive oil. So uh, I think there is also, in terms of urgency, I, I, I feel uh, the, um, the necessity to, uh, uh, to find as soon as possible and to open, possibly, uh, the um, uh, active principle uh, that are not, uh, in, some, in some way, are not av uh, available or are not uh, allowed to, to be used in uh, the olive trees uh, uh, culture. Okay, I can see your point. I also want to, uh, to tell you that uh, among the different control methods that we suggested for a comprehensive uh, strategy, uh, several of them can be applied by organic farmers so, uh, for example, vegetation management or enhancing the activity of parasitoids, predators, and uh, pathogens. Uh, all the agronomic measures are, of course, compatible with organic farming. And then, uh, as you mentioned, uh, also active ingredient uh, suitable for uh, organic uh, producers should be should be identified or eventually developed. <laughs> but of course, so far, the information are very few because, uh, uh, and also it's a, pro it's a matter of registration. But this is, this is not a problem which is in charge of scientists, I guess. And uh, scientists can uh, show how a given active ingredient is active. And then uh, companies should uh, apply for registration uh, in a given crop. The that's the reason because I told that uh, is a consideration because uh, if we want that the growers uh, become uh, active part uh, to this fight, I think we have also to have uh, tools for, uh, to, do, to do this. Okay. Uh, I participated in the uh, biology of um, 
of the of the bacteria and control working group and I'll, I'll listen to you I was wondering if we could consider the vector as a, a biological control agents against Xylella fastidiosa because uh, if the uh, the vector can uh, provide uh, inject the bacteria inside the sap we why we could not use the vectors to inject control agents against Xylella fastidiosa or chemical or any agents to control the disease because it is a part of the of the system and uh, why do to not imagine to use this part of the system in order to to control the the, the, the disease instead of concerning only the, okay. the, the the insect as a part of the of the problem thank you for the question this is a very exciting perspective but <coughs> we are in the very infancy of these studies uh, actually Insects can move, can transmit not only pathogens, but also endophytes, for example. And endophytes can eventually compete with the pathogen inside the, 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 the vessels of the plant. Uh, so this is an exciting perspective and maybe a good suggestion for basic studies now, because uh, still there are no contribution on the uh, actual capacity of uh, insect vectors of plant pathogens to transmit and to spread endophytes. In a way, maybe the insect vectors are not only dangerous, but they are also useful. Another possibility for using the vector as, a bio as a biological control tools is to, how can I say with a bad word, manipulate the microbiome, the endosymbiont, uh, as I told, as I told during the presentation, the microbiome associated with the foregut can eventually interact with xylella, which is retained in the foregut. So maybe kind of biological control can be envisaged at this level. So there are different levels that are worthy of investigation. So the last exchange is about uh, looking at the vector not necessarily as part of the problem, but also part of the solution. And it's, uh, it opens, of course, uh, new uh, uh, perspectives. Um, any final question or comment on, on uh, this part? Yes? Hi, this is uh, Rodrigo Krugner with the USDA. <coughs> I'd just uh, like to emphasize the importance of research on the reproductive biology of the vector. Uh, killing them can be quite easy with insecticides, biocontrol agents, but preventing them from uh, reproducing, it's a big challenge at the moment, especially for hemipteran insects. So just a comment, uh, uh, I was very happy that you guys had that in, the, in, the, in your plants. Yes, thank you. We, we underlined this point uh, and also we, we, we think that uh, endosymbionts like Volbachia can uh, can eventually be used to, to, to impact on the reproductive capability of these insects. And then we also have, we first have to make clear the reproductive biology of these insects because uh, not much is known, for example, about uh, ov ovarian diapos and, and so on. Did you say a thing? Yes, I would like to take the occasion of uh, one of the last slides shown by Domenico, where uh, it talked about the importance of establishing international fora, sharing information, and in fact this is part of the request we received from uh, uh, European Commission, the Director General for Research, when they ask us to organize now this workshop, they also ask us to uh, plan a way how to uh, keep uh, uh, everybody informed about the state of the art of research on xylella and its vectors and uh, how to share information between researchers. So that's something we will try to develop in the, in the next future and uh, uh, we will try to inform you when we publish the report how we intend to do this. Uh, of course, this is something we should not do alone, should be also in cooperation with the research institute working on these topics, the international organization like the European Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization, the Ofresco. So uh, and this was something we were discussing in the discussion group too, and I think it's 
uh, it, we should find, provide a fora really where the researcher can share the results, the negative and positive results, even uh, because sometimes researchers cannot publish negative results, but it's good to learn from mistake, to learn from negative results so that we don't repeat that. So, so that's something. Yes. And not only for vectors, of yeah, course. For everything. For, yeah, for, yeah. for all of that. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a very strong co uh, commitment of uh, of EFSA to uh, to continue to facilitate uh, uh, exchange within this uh, this uh, research uh, uh, community, and uh, um, I think we we're looking towards those um, those uh, next steps. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think it's time now to move to the to the to the third uh, presentation this uh, this morning. Uh, Group uh, Group Three, so uh, please um, come and 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 uh, and give us the uh, the outcomes of this uh, of this uh, breakout session. <coughs> okay, uh, good morning. I uh, tried to put in the table here the discussions that you have in this morning, yesterday, uh, in the afternoon also, about the. Break a, breakout group three, you are discussing about the plant. Uh, breaking. No, no, no. I, I'm asking you. Oh, here. Okay. Uh, you discussing about three different talks the host plant, the breeding or resistance for specifically for Xylella in all of the most of the discussion was did in this, and the certification program. Uh, okay, uh, you are putting uh, the uh, general discussions at the point that was discussed during the, this uh, section. After uh, we are doing some uh, the results that you are having, and uh, in the end of the, the, uh, the speech, you are going to put in the priority of the, the points. Uh, okay, we start about the discussion. Oh, sorry. Uh, before we start the discussion in our um, group, we have six different talks. The, uh, myself, we did talk about the um, uh, citru, uh, host hunting about Xylella in, in Brazil, or uh, sorry, now certification program, uh, and it's also breeding for resistance to Xylella. We are talking about citrus. And after we have not talked about the root stock, um, getting some uh, potential uh, improved for the, the canop to, to um, resistant to xyl uh, or not re it's resistant to xylella. And after we have two talk, uh, talks about the uh, germplasm banks. That was quite interesting. So we start to now our discussions point. About the, we discuss about the host definition and concept of the host susceptibility. Uh, okay, it's necessary to multi colonize multiplication movement in the plant to be considered a host. Uh, what what the importance of the primary and secondary host? The, the host has primary and secondary thirds of the inoculum to epidemiology of the disease, and also the different the the role of different roles on the the, the host of the epidemiology. Another point it's a, that you had discussed it's a multidisciplinary approach. Okay, the the, the, the people talking about the agronomic and cultural practice or agroecology, what that was uh, mentioned before, weed management and that was discussed in the in vector section, rule of plant for. Uh, nutrition and or integrate pest management that was discussing more tools of the toolbox so more information that you needed to to get with uh, uh, in, uh, integrate pest management uh, okay it's a quite interesting discussion that you have that it's about germoplasm and her resistance uh, okay, the, the first question was how to select the, uh, uh, the genotypes to, to be, the best genotypes to be selected, okay, the, uh, within the general plasma collections, uh, and how to increase the numbers of the genotypes to be tested. Okay, uh, you have an information that, for example, in Spain there is a, a huge general plasma bank, and that it was well uh, 
genetic, genetically characterized and the, the uh, 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 broad um, genetic base that could explore for the resistance against xylella. It's a quite important information. And also those for getting a resistance or tolerant variety, but after in the second or third step to use this one in the breeding program. Okay. Uh, well, sorry, uh, also you discussion about what the rules of the traditional breeding programs that's sometimes long, take long time, yes, take long time, but you must start this one. You don't know what the future. Um, okay. Uh, also, was was discussion about how to test the resistance of this material. About certification, uh, okay, different current, uh, requirements in different cases. Of, uh, uh, we mean um, infect the area, outside area. We mean uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it's certification. Uh, uh, it's possible to to produce. Uh, on a nursery plant in an open system in the area with no xylella occurrence. And it's, from my point of view, it's mandatory to use in a, uh, on, the open, on a closed system if you like to produce nursery plants in the, in the, in the uh, place in, when the disease is occurring. There's no way to produce a, a health plant if not put it in, into the protected environment in the conditions that you have the disease. Um, and the most important, uh, m again, my point of view, it's certification of the origin of the counters. Yesterday, we had get some information here that you have uh, interception of Xylella sandy, uh, subspecies sandy, uh, another strain from Xylella uh, subspecies palca, and also you have subspecies palca in outbreak here, and also you have a multiplex outbreak here. It's a huge number of introduction. Uh, it's intercept those plants is possible, yes, but you can intercept one, two, three, four, or six plants, and you don't import one, two, three, four, six plants. You are important. But, and what, what is the plant that was, was not intercepted? Uh, it's, it's, so it's, it's a, my point of view, one certification program must be done on the source of the infection, or source of the inoculum, sorry, the source of the inoculum. It's my, okay. Uh, okay, uh, managing the discussions points about the management of disease, difference by said in areas, there is uh, uh, areas on the, the, disease, the outbreak so severe, and uh, areas on the worst outbreak was, Starting, okay. There is my the here. Sorry, the 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 black. It's my my type is not the people. Uh, and the the past three areas, in my opinion, no management. And both areas, no management. You must eradicate the plants. Um, okay, uh, host range. We discussion about research needs. Now we are talking about research needs. You must know what the the range of research, the range of the host plants that you have here, because it's important for know about the epidemiology. Um, you must test different strains, sorry, mainly the, 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 the strains that, that was intercepted and not in the field. It's important to test. Um, okay, and the testing also in economic and relevant crops. Okay, and a lot of points that you, you mentioned, you go, go fast. Um, research available, you, you have uh, most of the information uh, only uh, 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 available in the, in the in literature about the host range of the bacterium, the different strains, you must go there and see the different hosts, uh, what strains are expected, uh, infected on roast, because you, you hear about oh, the Lela, it's a multi-host bacteria, but it's not True. You have some specific strain that infects specific hosts. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, about certification, certification procedures. Some pe some people uh, there is no, not uh, uh, say that is not uh, um, research. Um, 
research priority, but it's a politician or it's a defense priority. But the research must have a good for me, a good must support these people for decision for the decisions. Um, how prevent the new strains of the xylella management? No research. Okay, it's a just point that you put here. Um, about germplasm and the resistance, about the, 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 the results that you get from these discussions. Uh, again, to search the germplasm search to resistance uh, and starting with love and, and with uh, olive, but it's flowing down other relevant crops, could be. There is some good examples that was mentioned about the, the, the resistance to verticillium in, in olive Spain, could be using these this materials to the, uh, the material to be tested against xylella. Um, and it's also research and topics for corporations. Uh, environment conditions was discussing what what the 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 the, the, the importance of different environment conditions to disease expression. We know you must know about this one. Uh, again, multi, multi, multidisciplinary approaches like the management of the crops for the people that, for the, the, the growers that has a high incidence of the disease, how to survive with this one. Okay, the, the research I think is, is could be uh, look, could be look or uh, go to this way also to try to, to keep the, the plant al uh, alive, but in those in the how infect areas. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about in the buffer area. Okay, in the buffer area, in my point of view, it's uh, keep the disease in low, low, low pressure as possible. Um, okay. Uh, and about you discuss about the database. The, uh, we must, the, the people asking about the one, one uh, database about the pictures of different symptoms and different hosts to just for the main for the, to be used in areas when the disease is not been related yet. Okay, according to the priority, you select the, for example, the host plant definition. You define the host, the, uh, the host range of our species or strains already present in Europe. Okay, uh, how detect this within the, this host and all, uh, on site tests in the host plant database. Uh, we mean uh, it's, um, it's important to test if, for example, see multiplex that is present in, in, in Corsica could affect, affect olive plants. Okay, it's important to know this one. And the media, uh, medium priority uh, test resistance of subspecies or strain and no existent sub subspecies strain on economically relevant crops. Uh, we are talking about the interceptor in strains that was not established in the field, but you have the, 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 that interceptor strain, it's alive and can be tested if it could, could, uh, could in continue uh, in, con in control conditions, if could it, the, that intercept strain could cause disease in olive, for, for example, or grape, or almond. Okay, most to the, uh, it's a medium priority. Um, and so you 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 you, you uh, ranking here in, here in low priority some general data about the the pathways of the plants uh, for planting uh, and so. Uh, another point that was discussion was how to test the, the plant has a host. Uh, established uh, uh, was uh, discussion about the one uh, standard protocol for the for the uh, detection. Uh, I mean that you must then one one stand, 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 uh, standard protocol. Uh, I think it's important to be standard positive and negative controls to be used for the lab and share with the labs to be sure about that your detection xylella or another pattern. And it's, uh, the, the, sometimes the protocols can be uh, quite different between the labs, but the positive control must be well, well, well handled in, in the lab. Okay, another germplasm resistance. It's a it's a very high priority. Screen all of germplasm to 
xylella resistance. I think it's the most, most, most uh, high priority. You can use, select some interesting variety and can be prone to be used, or if not, can be start a breeding program. It's a long time again, it's a long time, but it must be started. Um, okay, also the medium priority to screen another relevant species for the xylella resistance. Uh, it's about the certification program, it's a high priority, but it's on the site, uh, on site test supporting, okay, certification. Again, uh, it's for some specific region in Europe is not so priority, but for, for this one, for some specific others, high priority. And again, the, great, the most priority, I, I, I think it's outside Europe from the source of the knocking of the bacterium. Um, okay, about the environment conditions, uh, we, you, you, you put on a medium priority test the multiple locations, environment conditions in to, to, to be the disease expressions. And also in the last one, it's a database about the symptoms. You would have priority to share with the people this information. How, for, this, for someone, uh, it's so, uh, I can say, it's easy to be uh, uh, symptoms related to xylella, but for another ones, it's not so easy. So it's the, the people that, that, that uh, there is no experience of this process. It's quite difficult to say, oh, it's plantars infect or not by xylella. It's symptoms, it looks like uh, plant infect by, by xylella or not. It's, uh, uh, on a database with different, uh, um, uh, with different symptoms in different plant species, you'll be very important. Okay, it's all. I'm open for questions. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Elvesio, for uh, for this uh, presentation. Again, uh, another very rich uh, presentation. Uh, we, we we can see that if 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 mentally we have uh, the vectors, the host, and 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 and, and the bacterium, it's uh, it's getting very much uh, interconnected. Yes. And yes. and obviously, uh, what you mentioned about crop management uh, uh, um, comes back uh, with the need of uh, integrated uh, uh, approach. Um, this uh, part probably raises the, the, the very important question of, uh, of the use we make of uh, genetic uh, uh, resources. I noted also the, the call for uh, experimental protocols that are uh, uh, quite uh, standardized and, and agreed. And again, this uh, idea of data and information uh, uh, sharing. Uh, but uh, this is open for uh, questions and, 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 and discussion. Please. So this is Josep Jacas from EFSA uh, Plant Health Panel and University Jama Premier from Spain. And I, I just, when you talked about resistance, you didn't mention tolerance. Was that on purpose or I was wondering? No, why? no, no it's, it was most considered uh, tolerance also. It's the, uh, my definition is tolerance, it's that the, the bacteria was present in the, in the plant, but we can, the disease is not expressed. Okay, I think tolerance is important also. Okay, you have the, the, your, your question is it's important or not this information? Uh, the question, my question was when you were talking about resistance, you didn't mention or you didn't uh, put the. I mean, okay, even okay, here, yeah, yeah, it's a talking about tolerance. Yeah. So I, I, I was wondering whether it was excluded on purpose or no, whether no, no, you were no, considering no, 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 tolerance. A, yes, so I think I, that I think it must consider the tolerance also. Just yeah, a clarification. Have, yeah, yes. Okay. Thanks. Under request. Uh, yes, uh, concerning certification, I, um, I, I think it should be stressed a little bit more because most ornamentals are not certified in Europe. So it's a need, apart of the, uh, the fact that uh, ornamentals are the primary uh, host asymptomatic sometimes, so uh, it's an urgent need of certification for plants which are carrying the, the pathogen in Europe. Now, concerning to evaluate uh, the certification outside Europe, I mean, uh, of course, nursery should be located in area which are considered uh, uh, pathogen free. Uh, uh, but how can we uh, rely on uh, uh, the monitoring and uh, uh, surveillance program in other countries if we have not 
uh, such programs ready in, uh, in Europe. So is um, uh, to, to see, okay, I will import only certified material from abroad. I don't un I not understand uh, what we can do uh, outside Europe in okay. order to prevent uh, the entrance of, of the pathogen through the infected propagating material, uh, which is a, I mean, different, uh, difficult. Okay, I, I, I will try to just give an example that you have in our experience, for example. It's not a certification material, but it's just for have an idea how could this work. For example, to we export orange to Europe, the, the orange must be free of an, a specific pathogen. It's called, um, uh, um, I can't remember, it's a fungi, okay? Uh, firstly, you must select one, sele one, one free area. Some people from a community, uh, one, one delegates from Europe go there and check. You see, yes, yes, you can start the producing for the, the to, to export. And after, again, we we receive two, uh, two or three different uh, um, delegates from there to check if the material is clean or not. It will be the same. You are buying something. If you are buying something, you can you can have, uh, you can have, uh, you can uh, um, um, you you'd like to buy something good. Okay, you can go there and check if you know it's it's correct. Uh, uh, do you understand me? Of course I do. <laughs> no, I'm not questioning. I mean, I, I I think we can at least rely on fact that the plants should be tested the mandatory before to arrive. I mean, uh, how can we rely on the situation at inf infected sites in, in another country? I mean, it's a, it's a difficult issue. Anyway, no, I think... I, I, I think, don't know. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no, Go no I, th I think it should be very much stressed at the, the importance of certification in Europe, at least. No, yeah, of course For circulation in Europe. No, no, of course there okay, is. Okay, maybe, maybe we can leave uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the floor to... Uh, to Harry um, and, and the, the commission. Yeah, yes, thank you very much, because I think it's important to, to underline, uh, well, we have a standardized approach for this, so certification for plants that come uh, from outside uh, the EU into the EU, well, the certification has to be uh, uh, guaranteed by the issuance of a phytosanitary certificates, and we have introduce specifically for this the requirement that there must be the guarantee either it comes from a pest-free country but we need an official statement of that country for that separately from the headquarters or a recognized pest-free area or the plants should be should come from uh, a nursery free from but the nursery free from uh, they should be during the se uh, growing season uh, officially uh, followed up by by inspectors and tested tested uh, per consignment before sending to Europe and at import all consignment of plants they are inspected every single consignment is at the border inspected and uh, well they are they are tested depending on where where they see that there, there might be some some reasons for taking a, a, a sample and test it in, in the lab. So it's a quite a standardized uh, procedure that, that, uh, that, that should cover this. It's the same with the citrus black spot disease that you yes, were referring to yes. for, for, for the citrus. It's exactly yeah. the same. Uh, uh, just, just keep in mind that Xylella, it's a systemic bacterium that has a long incubation period in the plant. Just keep in mind this one. And most of in our tech, the techniques that you are using by diagnosing these plants, it's, there is a threshold that you can be sure that it's positive, that the plant is negative or not. Just keep in mind this one. I see a question here. Ali. Hi, Russell. Yeah, Alex Purcell. Um, I, I probably had as much experience, not, not to brag, but as anybody in the world on the performance of Xylola in different posts, probably different 50 species or something. And, and this is uh, recovering them and so forth, so trying to figure out what they're doing. And 
just based on that, how long it takes and how difficult it is not to make a mistake at it. In other words, uh, you declare if something's not a host and later you study it in more detail, you find, oh, it is, you know, it's temporary host, that kind of thing. Okay. I think your objective of learning what it does in all these other hosts is just wildly optimistic that you will be able to do that. So I think there needs to be some guy, and on the other hand, it is, as you point out, very important to know, is there some key host? Um, one thing about the alternative hosts that don't have <laughs> symptoms is they can be so easily missed because it's ir uh, sporadically distributed, <laughs> unevenly distributed, at very low populations sometimes. And yet, vectors can find that. They'll pick it up from that. It's amazing. Um, so I think there needs to be a combination of evaluation of how are you going to prioritize this? Because I, I think I gave you some illustration of how a very high percentage of plants will harbor xylella in an experimental kind of a setting. Okay. And the other thing is even with crops. For example, in California, we test both in the field and the lab uh, some of the almond strains, multiplex strains, in plums. Well, it caused a horrible disease. We never see this disease in the field, not one case. Uh, same with sweet cherry. You inoculate it, it looks like bacterial canker. Um, but we don't see that in the field. So there's, a, there's two levels of performance, and, and we can't explain why it is. Yeah, yeah I understand. But how on the other hand, in, in, um, in, in grapes, you know, you have varietal differences in tolerances. They're useful in really spots where it's very difficult. That would be Salento with olives now. And so um, with almonds, there are certain varieties that are extremely tolerant and others are extremely susceptible. And if where it's the only place we have problems is you have this one row because different rows are different varieties for pollination. That's all that variety is always hit with this leaf squarch disease in almond. So there needs to be some prioritization. Okay, thank you, thank you. Brings us slowly to, um, to this uh, issue of drivers for epidemics and, um, and here certainly the, the, the genetic resources. I think we, we have another question here. Yes, I, I've seen from the presentation that uh, you talk about source of tolerance or resistance in olive and that we have a, a very huge gerboplast collection of olive in the Mediterranean, in Spain, in Greece, also in some other country, I think. So how, what's, this, what's the idea for research? How to test all these varieties? Which is the tools? Uh, can we, we cannot bring Silella in Spain to test no, it? No, no, but <laughs> yeah, but you, can, but, but you can bring the plant for, to Italy. Okay, the curtain, you can the, 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 the pro propagate the plant, the, doing some curtain. Uh, I, I did some inoculation using curtain like this one, and it was, it was in fact by Zalala. Olive, using olive, so you can put, multiply the, the the plant in the in the origin, for example, in Spain, and bring to Italy and, and doing the, the stuff here in, in in Salento, for example. No way, no, it's no problem. It's, okay, it's it's easy for me. I don't know. It's my. I don't know if there is some specific, specific rules that you can can bring the plants. I don't know, but it's for. Technical proposal, I think. I think, I think Harry wants to uh, elaborate on the, on that uh, part. Yes, thank you very much. It, it, it's a point that we have picked up in, in, in indeed, and that we today, it's uh, it's 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 uh, forbidden to plant plants in the infested area, uh, host plants, but uh, we will put a proposal on the table to allow this that for research purposes that there would be the possibility but because of the of course the, there has to be uh, it, it might be one of the things that that need of course to be uh, double checked uh, what about resistant uh, varieties and and the the containment area so the south of Lecce uh, is uh, uh, probably an uh, uh, the appropriate place to to indeed uh, check this so uh, today there is not uh, the legal possibilities to do this because we uh, but uh, but uh, tomorrow uh, there will be this possibility. But you can use uh, you can do it in in, in the screen house in uh, continuous condition. I don't know. Okay, but I, I didn't understand nothing about the the, the the legislations here. Okay, 
I just got my technical point of view. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. <laughs> Thank it's you. good that uh, we have uh, participants from uh, from uh, uh, different uh, from different angles in the in in this room to to clarify that. Is there any uh, last question or or request for uh, 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 comments? If not, I, I, I propose that we move to uh, session four and uh, Maria Agnès will uh, give us uh, the outcome of, uh, of this, um, of this uh, group. Hello, everybody. So, um I will uh, report what was discussed in the group four. So this group was actively interacting and I think we had a very fruitful discussion. So I want to thank all the participants in this group. And we, we were discussing on the pathogen, so xylella, its biology, its genetic and the control. So, uh, yes. First, we had uh, six talks to introduce the session. First, I made a review on the life traits of xylella and of the control methods that are currently in use or in development, and mainly, of course, in the Americas. Then we had two talks on the genetic diversity and on methodology to assess and to type strains. This was given by Maria Saponari on the strain that, were, that is in Italy or were intercepted in Italy and by Tanja Dreo, who presents so the methodology to detect and to type strains. Then we had a talk by Emilio Montesinos on the, the usefulness of peptides to be used against xylella based on their efficiency on other bacterial pathogens. And then we had two talks on the diffusible factor DSF First, how it can be used to control xylella, and another talk, uh, so the talk on the, the usefulness of DSF as a target to control xylella was given by Pasquale Saldarelli, and then Xavier Dora gave a talk on the genetic of the DSF uh, RPF gene cluster in uh, xylella as a comparison with Stenotrophomonas. And then Blanca Landa presented the two tasks that address xylella diversity and genetics in pond project. So just a few words on the methodology of the discussion we had. So we made a round table so that to be sure that everyone can uh, raise burning questions on the need of research in uh, Europe uh, that can be funded by Europe. We listing all these research points that need to be addressed. And we identified four points of discussion. The three first were around the biology and the genetics of xylella. So the questions we addressed were, what hitherto not studied aspect of xylella biology should be a research priority for the EU? How much should the research focus on the development of genetic tools to study the biology of xylella? And should all the characterized strains be made available to researchers in publicly accessible culture collections? <laughs> and then we had a question that was related to the control of the bacterium in the plant. So the question was, given the research aimed at controlling or killing xylella in the plant already done in the Americas, which tools for bacterium control in plant have a potential for field application? So the various, we had three groups of discussion, and then we summarized all the points that were raised by these three groups of discussion. We discussed them, and this morning we argued on the principles that should be used to rank these diverse research needs. So the guiding principles that were used to rank the research needs were first we had to identify this research. Is it a short, a mid or long-term research? And 
whereas quality of the research in terms of contribution to knowledge is very important, we shouldn't uh, um, ignore the, that the applied science knowledge is very important to develop solutions. So these are very important um, principles to prioritize the choices. And of course, we have to consider also the socio-economic impact of the expected results of the research that have to be proposed and the socio-economic impact of the epidemics that should happen in Europe. So here are the different points we identified and we ranked. First, concerning the biology and the, oops, sorry, the biology and the genetics of xylella. So as a major short-term point, we identified first the necessity to assess the genetic diversity of xylella, so basically on making use of NGS technology to develop more efficient typing tools, but also to assess the genetic diversity of the wool plant microbiome. So we do not have only to focus on xylella, but also on all the microorganisms that are in the xylem vessels and accompany uh, xylella. So of course, this has to be done in a comparison between healthy and diseased plants. We also mentioned the importance of enhancing xylella cultivation methods, but also storage methods. It is this, this organism is fastidious, it's difficult to store, and it was um, pointed that we also should focus on the inoculation methods, and this was already discussed in the previous group also. And in link with this cultivation method, storage method, we discussed on the need for reference collections, that should store, of course, specimens, but that all specimens that should be stored and be made available to the community should be also sequenced, and that all these specimens should be accompanied by metadata on the place of isolation, host of isolation, and as many data as we are. And these reference collections should represent the diversity of the xylella strains of course, we should take care of the genetic stability of this organism during storage and the virulence stability. It has been mentioned many times that during storage, xylella will lose uh, aggressiveness. As major mid-long-term points, we identified the necessity to improve the knowledge on xylella interactions with its abiotic environment and it was um, proposed to emphasis on the uh, role of temperature in winter versus summer on the um, physiology of xylella and on the interactions of xylella with its biotic environment. So, of course, interaction with the plant, but also with the vector and, as already mentioned, with all the microbiome. We had a quite long debate on the core postulates and the need to fulfill these core postulates, but also on the evidences that already are present that xylella is a causal organism of disease worldwide, so and the difficulties to, to fulfill this core postulate. We identified a research point as the molecular to identify the molecular determinant of pathogenicity or host specificity and host reaction. And by here we mean that what has already been identified as molecular determinant of pathogenicity for peers disease strains or for CVC strains may not be all um, um, determinants of pathogenicity for other strains and, for example, for the POCA strains on olives. So we may have to consider other pathosystems and to identify the key determinants of pathogenicity on other pathosystems, not only on Pierce disease and CVC, and not only to consider that these are uh, general 
pathosystem, uh, pathogenicity determinants. And we discussed quite a lot on the host reaction on um, does the plant perceive the bacterium and react to the bacterium, so there are already some evidences, but this should be maybe emphasis. We also identified the necessity of uh, developing tagged strains, so for example, GFP mark strains, to unveil the histopathology of the plant xylella interactions in terms of tissue that are contaminated, but also in terms of distributions in the plant. This can have consequences, of course, for sampling. So these are the research points ranked uh, around the biology and the genetics of xylella. Concerning the control in plant, we wanted to point to uh, three context elements. The control uh, methods that were discussed need, of course, to match farmer expectation. This should be a participatory approach. And of course, all this has to be discussed in terms of integrated approach. We mentioned the fact that there should be differences in controlling the disease and the bacterium. Of course, the bacterium can be present in the plant and the plant can remain asymptomatic. So controlling the bacterium and controlling the disease is not the same thing. So we have to keep that in mind. And also control methods should prevent, but also may cure the, the disease. And we have to consider also the forecasting for this disease. So the research points that were identified and that were focused so on the pathogen in the plants are uh, the physical approaches. So what are the mode of action, for example, of the hot or cold water, or hot water treatment or cold, cold temperature treatment that may cure the plant from the bacterium? What are the mode of actions? Are uh, hot water treatment available for other plants than grapevine and should be this developed? We also discussed the necessity to evaluate different strategies, but also the methodologies of application for various biocontrol agents, so peptide, as it was mentioned, but other chemicals also. Is it uh, our stimulation of defense uh, possibility to control the disease? And are some natural products also uh, be made available to control diseases caused by xylella? And we all noticed that transgenic solutions are not feasible in the EU because of the regulation. So we, will, we haven't discussed that. So we mentioned that in the, in the context of the research that has already been made in the States or in Brazil, how can we cooperate with ongoing research? It's of course very easy to have access to what is published, but to cooperate with ongoing research needs to, to cooperate with labs, to have interactions with labs that are working for a long time or that have been working for a long time in the US or in Brazil. So we have to think about the added value of this cooperation that can be proposed. And we identified several research topics for such cooperation. For example, it was mentioned that the genetic tools are already developed, a lot of genetic tools are already developed in labs in the US for functional analysis, and it's not uh, useful to, re, uh, to redevelop them, but we can uh, collaborate to have access to them. Also, we have to collaborate to have access to xylella diversity for the collection we mentioned earlier on but also to have access to the diversity that may be uh, poorly known for the moment at the areas of origin of these pathogens. And we mentioned a point on how to facilitate exchange of material for research purposes while, of course, respecting regulations. 
within the EU, EU. It may be quite complicated for the moment to exchange material, but this is useful. And can we enhance this um, transfer of material? So that's the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. Yes, um, very good wrap-up. Uh, um, maybe not everybody in the room is familiar with the Cox uh, postulates. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, very simply is I find an, a, a diseased organism, I isolate um, a pathogen, I re-inoculate the pathogen in an healthy organism, and, and I have the same uh, manifestations, and I can re-isolate the, the, the pathogens. I think that's the idea behind the, uh, the Cox uh, uh, postulates. Um, you, you clearly differentiate disease from, uh, from uh, infection, which goes also along the lines of uh, resistance versus uh, uh, um, uh, tolerance. I see that you introduced the socioeconomic impact, uh, which uh, was not in, uh, in, in, in previous uh, uh, presentations. That's, uh, that's very uh, interesting. I note also that, uh, again, this uh, issue of sharing, uh, sharing information data, and, and agree also on the metadata, mm -hmm. uh, because the, those, uh, those uh, uh, data may be used by different parties for different purposes, and, and we have to be, uh, uh, um, to be uh, cautious that the metadata attached to those data are, are the, the ones that will serve the purpose of, uh, of other people in the community. And of course, again, uh, to broaden this, uh, this uh, research community. Um, questions? Yes, Ciro. Okay, Ciro Gardi, Plant Health uh, of EFSA. One question concerning the interaction with the uh, abiotic, abiotic factors, because it was a point that was also emerged, raised during our discussion in session three. So do, did you get any idea or suggestion on how to test this uh, if in a natural condition, in confined environment, or in uh, like uh, resotrons or other systems? I think that was what was discussed was, of course, confined experiments uh, with various uh, range of temperature, considering the effect of cold temperature. I think that's what you are uh, focusing on. So, in my opinion, what was presented and discussed was that the effect of the various range of temperature, so cold but also hot temperature, uh, in confined environment, we mentioned uh, the useful for the necessity to address this point on various pathosystems, of course, and uh, we did not mention at that point if the plant how the plant have to be inoculated, but that may have some impact also. But that's the point that were discussed, I think. Thank you. There was yes, please. Maria López from Valencian Institute for Agricultural Research in Valencia, Spain. Uh, I would like to uh, make a suggestion um, regarding to international cooperation because I think that taking into account the difficulties in reproducing uh, pathogenicity in different hosts and the long list of uh, hosts uh, of, uh, of the different species of Silella fastidiosa that are uh, doubtful in, in some cases, maybe uh, to plant these plants in uh, plots uh, with uh, similar design in California, in, in Brazil, in Costa Rica, and in Italy could give uh, useful information uh, because uh, different vectors will be present in the different uh, situations and maybe uh, the nature can uh, uh, give uh, more uh, rapid uh, information about uh, the whole range of uh, different strains than performing uh, inoculations under control conditions in uh, uh, quarantine uh, greenhouses and so on. It's just a suggestion. Yes, I think it's very interesting. And I wonder, uh, this can be useful 
for, for example, in Italy, for the strain poker that is present in the olives. So we may have uh, more information on the other plants that can be host for this strain. But uh, I'm not sure that it will be so easy to test, for example, the host range of uh, other strains like multiplex or sandy strains that are not uh, making such epidemics uh, anywhere. Sandy and uh, multiplex strains are isolated in the, in the US, for example. But as far as we know, there are not real epidemics due to these strains in these places. So this may be linked to the presence of uh, insects, and we may have different situations in Europe and different plants. So I think it's an uh, important uh, point to raise, but it has to be also uh, made in comparison to inoculation tests that has to be made in confined area. These are complementary, I think. Thank you. Other questions? No? Are you getting exhausted? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, please. Mass from uh, Belgium Research Institute. Um, Maybe some uh, more explanation on the uh, uh, abiotic factors that are possibly involved in tolerance uh, to um, or pathogenicity to uh, disease. Uh, of course, you can work in contained conditions with the plants, uh, but they are not only temperature uh, you can uh, emphasize, but you can, for instance, emphasize uh, drought tolerance because already um, in different talks, uh, also yesterday, we uh, see that drought has an important effect on the plant and in this way also on the bacterial behavior, or could have. And we, we have the, seen the gradients, uh, I think in, it was in Brazil, where you go from drought to more uh, humid uh, conditions and so on. So drought, also fertilization, and this of course relies to the to the cultures uh, of plants and not to the, the, wild, uh, the wild green or the natural greens. But these things can be uh, checked um, in contained conditions, but also there are some ways on how to work in vitro with xylene and xylene uh, fluids to see the reactions of xylella. Just an extra um, explanation on that. to elaborate on that or no? No. thank you last chance no okay thank you very much I would like to uh, congratulate the all reporters for those uh, sessions uh, I find it uh, incredible that uh, they managed to uh, to uh, capture those discussions and uh, and bring them back to uh, to the floor I would like to, to remind you that uh, there will be a report from, uh, from the workshop uh, and of course this report will be uh, an opportunity to, to go uh, uh, deeper in the details of, uh, of, of, the, of the discussions and, uh, and, and, and the proposals and um, that this report will be published on, uh, on the EFSA website uh, in the near future. Uh, I've heard the target of uh, mid-December uh, for the publication of, uh, of, of the report. I think it will be a, a, a very valuable tool uh, that we gather all these, uh, all these contributions. Um, we're a bit uh, ahead in the, in the schedule, which is, uh, which is great. Um, we, we have now a, a presentation by uh, Annette uh, Schneegans from uh, um, DG uh, Agri. She will talk about uh, uh, the opening of, uh, of research or calls for research uh, within uh, Horizon 2020 uh, with a particular focus on, uh, on uh, Xylella fastidiosa. Welcome, Annette, and, uh, and uh, we're listening to you. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to, to present today. Um, something on research, on research openings. 
You've been busy one and a half days discussing the state of the art, the state of um, disease development, uh, many political issues, um, well, policy regulatory issues maybe, but in particular you have been looking at the gaps of knowledge. So what do we know, what do we don't know? And now you may want to know where do you get the money for, for your research. So I will present uh, very briefly the general openings for plant research, so for plant health and plant protection, which are there, really. It's quite um, widespread in the program. And then go into a more specific opening. There has been quite recently a call for research on Zilella. So just to introduce you, to the general structure of Horizon 2020, which is the main research program of the EU. There are three pillars, one dealing with more bottom-up science excellence. They know the European Research Council, Marie Curie, Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions, or infrastructures. These are all programs where you don't need to have a certain topic published. You can submit whatever you think is important for mobility and training, such as Marie Curie, or for excellent, uh, what they call um, blue sky research under the ERC. Then you have a whole industrial leadership part, the pillar two, which is looking to enable technologies. And there you have a strong biotechnology program where you can also find openings for research on more basic principles of, of biotech. And there's an SME program, which is more on the applied side of research. Finally, we have a third part called Societal Challenges, which is what you, uh, I think in the US you call mission-oriented research. This is a top-down approach where we do publish topics of interest, either because there's an urgency or there's a general knowledge gap. And there you have seven challenges, one of which is dealing with agriculture, primary production, forestry, um, marine issues, and the bioeconomy. And this is the one I will be focusing at. So in the following slides, you will see a lot of talk about challenge two. Challenge two has a total of about 3.7 3 billion euros um, to tackle the whole primary production chain, as I said, and food, food industry, and bio-based resources. So you will find in the legal specific program these headings, 2.1, agriculture forestry, 2.2, agri-food sector, 2.3, aquatic living resources, 2.4, bio-based industry, and 2.5 is marine cross-cutting issues. And again, here I will focus on 2.1, agriculture and forestry. Now, this is the legal basis. How do we come from this specific program you've just seen to work programs? Work programs are what we have just published where you find all the topics of interest to you, potentially. We have a process called strategic programming and out of the last exercise, we've come up with calls. One on sustainable food security, blue growth, rural renaissance, bio-based innovation, and we contribute to other calls within other challenges or parts of the program. So now, when you see the work program, you will be most interested in the Sustainable Food Security, SFS is the acronym, where you will find topics of interest for plant health and plant protection. So this is at a glance, the four calls. And you see already, budget-wise, the Sustainable Food Security goal is the largest. 430 million in 16 and 17 on primary production and nutrition security and food industries. In that call, you will find six headings. I won't go into detail of this. For you just to know, when you go through the work program, um, you, you will find several headings dealing with resilience of agriculture and the food chain, of climate, um, climate smart, uh, health issues, and so on. Now, the concrete topics that may be of relevance for, for you if you're generally interested in plant health and plant protection. These topics 
one for example on contentious inputs, including pesticides, targeting organic farming where you have pretty specific regulations on what you can use and you can't. There's a dedicated Zilella topic, I will say something on this in a minute. There's something on very general open topic on any kind of emerging diseases in plants which have a certain economic impact and relevance to, to be tackled and terrestrial livestock. Here you will find the nasty sentence, Zilella research is excluded because we have the SFS9 topic. So, I mean, there are other diseases that I think deserve uh, also attention. Um, then there's um, an open topic again on perennial crops in tropics and subtropics. And uh, something that I, I think has come up a lot la yesterday and today as well, uh, financing to developing harmonized diagnostic tools for animal and plant health. So this is a very, very valid opening in addition to the SFS9 topic on Zilella. And finally, there's a specific topic on developing a new type of plant protection products, alternatives to existing ones, which uh, are either critical or probably phasing out or uh, are not effective anymore. So, and then there's a topic which looks a bit further away, which is more on agroecology, but yesterday we had discussions in which uh, participants mentioned that you actually need to look into plant, 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 microbe interactions as part of the management options to control disease, to increase tolerance, to increase resilience of plants. And there's a very good opening in this topic, SFS 28. So, and then there's a list of topics that look a bit more distant, but still have a look at it. Maybe there is openings for having an element of Zilella in it. When we talk about exploiting benefits of species diversity, we're looking what are the benefits when you have mixed cropping systems, intercropping. You have what is the biological basis of benefits such as decreased disease incidence or increased um, tolerance to drought, to abiotic stresses. So there you could also look at some issues of plant, plant, plant microbe interactions. Um, and then there's a topic testing and breeding for sustainability. It's about the uh, variety testing. But again, disease resistance is a big issue in that. Under robotics, you may think it may be possible or interesting to look at to precision application of plant products or precision application of uh, precision pruning or monitoring. So I, I think there could be an, an opening. And finally, we have a bottom-up topic, which is called thematic networks, where you can submit any type of uh, area in which you think there could be potential solutions that you need to exchange and test. It's not a research topic. It's really a topic where you discuss and test practical solutions. So I may invite you to look into this, if uh, Zilella or any other kind of plant has coordinated action could fit into this topic. And there's a forest tree breeding topic where resistance is also mentioned, looking for resistance breeding. So this is the overall frame where I think you can find quite a lot of uh, funding opportunities for your communities. Now, there's a call for proposals, um, specifically asking you to submit research ideas on how to tackle Zilella fastidiosa. It has a budget of about seven million, no, up to seven million euro EU contribution. We say in the text, this is the range. You are invited to submit other amounts. But this is about the budget available for this topic. And um, what we ask you to, to submit ideas to tackle the disease in a very comprehensive matter, starting or looking from prevention to early detection, control. So throughout the whole range of issues we have discussed in the four working groups yesterday and today, 
By this, increasing knowledge on the biology of the pathogen, the vector, looking at host vector pathogen interactions in epidemiology. And out of that, come up with practical guidelines um, to help authorities, producers, uh, to prevent and manage the disease in both conventional and organic systems. And in, in elements also to develop risk assessment in eradication plans. So this is on the content. And there are a couple of other conditions. Um, you will see it's really quite a broad topic, so these seven million seem quite justified. Because um, obviously work will focus in some ways or others on the Apulian strain, but you should also look at other strains that could represent a major risk. We've seen yesterday and today how, how important that part of research is. International collaborations highly encourage, not just because uh, that would certainly benefit the research here, but also because somebody said you shouldn't reinvent the wheel. So try and use the tools available, the experience available elsewhere. And also use the ongoing research that was presented by Ufresco and the Ponte um, Consortium. For Ponte, you have a sentence saying something like, this should be complementary. This is a legal term. Complementarity in legal terms means you will have to, the successful proposal will have to collaborate to share data, these other conditions. It's a very, very firm collaboration where you will have to sort of open up your knowledge and, and share between the two consortia. And something I didn't mention here, there's a term in the topic called multi-actor approach. Whatever you do should be done in following the multi-actor um, approach. To us it seemed logical because of the breadth of the topic, but people here ask, what does it mean? It simply means that according to the needs and the tasks you're doing, you need to have on board so researchers, obviously, uh, plant health authorities, regional authorities, producers, it's needed civil society. So all the actors that seem relevant to increase success of your actions should be in there. And not just at the end of the project when you have a conference, but really from the very beginning when you implement. So this is a kind of making sure that there's a flow of information and that research questions are shaped by the needs of the various actors. So, quite a challenging uh, topic, and we hope, of course, that you, you find it um, also interesting and uh, put your heads together to, to submit proposals. The timeline is the following. The call was just published mid-October. It's this two-stage submission. Uh, no, sorry, this is an exception. This will be first, uh, just a one-stage submission uh, topic, which means that you will have a deadline 17th February for a full proposal. For other topics we have, you have first a short proposal, then a longer one. Here you just have one proposal, which is a full one. Deadline 17th February. This is again quite challenging because you have Christmas in between. But this was a way to try and enforce quick action so that the selected project can start, hopefully, end of the year. By that time, Ponte will be about one year in place and working. So what we hope is that you take Ponte, let's say, as a baseline to show then how you progress beyond that. Hmm? You take into account what is done there, not duplicate, but rather advance and build on that. Um, you have, of course, a couple of tools, and information, documents to help you, guide you through the whole process of how do I build a consortium, how, what do I need, how do I write, and so on. you find them here. And this will be disseminated. Um, I just ask you to look oops, very careful. Uh, in your member states, when you have consortia, a couple of uh, member states, you have national contact points that are really, really good in helping you also to draft and to, to put in place your ideas. Use them. We have seen this assistance to very, very good effect in proposals. They also, we do also have national contact points for the US, for Latin America, so please um, 
uh, go and consult your colleagues on this. And by this we hope that we will get very, very good proposals. But of course, this is to say that we need very good research to deliver results that are effective, to somehow see how we continue managing and controlling and, and preventing these, this disease. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Annette, for uh, this uh, this presentation and uh, and the good news that you that you bring with you. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. If you have questions for Annette, request for clarification. Yes. Um, I I have a question on how it works in the evaluation of proposals. Uh, so. Uh, it's, the proposals can be uh, asking for up to seven million, and then, uh, well, usually the calls are very broad in, in what they require. What I've never seen um, in my surroundings is that a smaller group of researchers would go for a proposal of, uh, say, half a million or one million and focus on parts of what the call mm -hmm. is asking for. Is this a possibility, or would you not recommend that? Of course, it's possible, but um, if you see, you have three criteria. One is more the science, the concept. Then you have uh, the impact, and you have the implementation. If you go to the impact, this is the number one criteria, when you have two equal ones, scored equally. Of course, a proposal ticking all the boxes will potentially have more impact. So yours will be seen as too narrow, too focused, and not enough impact, even if it's science-wise, it's excellent. So there's a big risk, in a way. And um, yeah. also, I think, you, if, if you see what you're requested to do in the scope, you will just not manage, in a way, to address really the whole philosophy if you only focus a very, very specific, narrow aspect. But having said that, in a consortia, this is a beauty of a consortia, that all together you manage to meet these ambitions. But yourself, you have a very, very dedicated, very focused task. So I think for yourself, you will probably as a partner not get more than half a million in the work on very specific issue. <laughs> Thanks, so, so the idea is to, 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 to bring bigger consortia together and, 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 and address most of, this, uh, of, of the content of the call, rather than specific uh, points? Well, there's no number and, and on size of, of a consortium, but you need to take care to bring in the expertise needed to meet the demands of the topic and, and uh, to meet the impact that is expected. In this way, if you have seen, if you look at all the issues, you will need a lot of expertise that I think is not available in one institute or in two or three institutes. Yeah. Sure. Yes, please. Hi. Here. <laughs> uh, Joana from Portugal. In some other competitive um, fundings, uh, like Interreg and another, we have a kind of portal where we can um, fill up some forms and we can describe our field of research and we can find partners to build up consortium. Mm. We found it very useful and we have managed <coughs> in our institute to uh, integrate some of those consortium, not by meeting people, but by filling the gaps in this proposal. So I think it would be, since we are all here, I think it's a very nice uh, tool that we can use mm. to form this global <laughs> consortium and to find partners because we think it's one of our obstacles is to find the right consortium and how to help mm. fill in the gaps. Just a suggestion. Yeah, it would be great if you have that kind of tools. Also in the, so the main tool for, can I go back? Could we have the presentation? Sorry. Um, in the participant portal, which is the main tool for everything, for finding, fund, for finding calls, for managing your project as well, there is a first um, frequently asked questions section. Then there's also 
uh, tool where you can submit questions, which go to a cent central service. And then there's also um, a partner search function. Now, m the feedback I've received from applicants is that, of course, it helps. But if you don't know the partners, it, it's probably not going to be the best consortium, in a way, or the e most easy collaboration. So it's there as a tool, and I encourage you to use it. But still, then there's another step needed, sort of it's still meeting and discussing and so on and so forth. So the, all the tools are there, in a way. But I think that events like today, where you meet face to face, you make contact, is, is the best. Thank you. And I hope. Uh we make the best of uh, of uh, of this uh, of this workshop obviously uh, just just for clarification you you mentioned access to data and information you you do not mean the final uh, report you mean a real open data policy and 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 is this mandatory or or not yeah. could you clarify i think maybe the ponte uh, coordinator donato is still here yes so well, i I can't see you behind you <laughs> with the micro. So I haven't, so, I must say, there's a legal clause, which you have in your contract, which you have seen now. I didn't see the legal text yet, but as far as I understand, the legal requirement to be complementary and collaborate, to request that you open up, actually, your data. If you create resources, and not the ones for publishing, but really, before publication, data resources. These are shared between the two projects in order to avoid the duplicate things that you have overlaps. So it's a, in a way, it's a really, really competitive issue that you need to have probably um, an agreement between the two projects on what you share, how you share, and how you make sure that this is kept in between the, both, uh, the, the two consortia. But, but you may wish to explain because you've seen already the contract. Uh, as far as I remember, in the contract is, is not detailed this, uh, the, uh, how to share things, but it's a request that we have to interact to, and to be available to, to share all the all the content of the project to be, to be sure that the, the other one it, it is a complementary it's not overlapping the mm. now i don't remember the exactly the the words that are written in the contract mm. but there is not uh, as far as i remember there are no detail on how to to proceed with this uh, uh, collaboration how mm. how can i say Okay, but have a look because I think it's absolutely awesome intellectual property rights and so on. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this clarification. Any any additional question? No. Thank you again. So, so if I can just add oh, one uh, information one. that, uh, uh, sorry, in view of this uh, of this requirement now. Uh, maybe it has been already published, but uh, within a couple of days, no more, uh, we are going, going to publish the, at least the summary at the, uh, at the major uh, uh, lines of the project in, uh, at the moment in the website of the, our institute, because while we are waiting to, to, to get ready the website of the project that uh, we, we hope to get uh, ready in uh, some 20 days. Uh, but. Uh, so we are starting to to make public the content of the of the project in, in order to allow the, the uh, candidate consortium that want to apply for uh, mm -hmm. the the new call to have access to the the, the information. And of course, we are uh, we we must be available to to give all uh, further details. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, this uh, brings us to uh, the, the, the last part of, uh, of this workshop and an important one. Again, uh, 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 Mike Jagger has uh, accepted uh, kindly to, uh, um, to, gi to, to play the role of, uh, of overall reporter uh, and, and, to, uh, and to wrap up our, our, our discussion. So, uh, Mike, 
the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, of course, it's always an invidious pleasure to close a meeting when everybody has probably got flights and trains to catch, but I will do my best not to detain you too long. Um, it's very good that we've had this last presentation um, uh, on, the, on the new call specific to Xylella, but more in the, the overall context as well. Um, in the opening talk of this meeting, which was given by uh, DG uh, Research and Innovation, um, he stressed the need for interaction, and I think the fact that this call opens tomorrow emphasizes the fact that interaction, if it's not already present, certainly needs to be in place very quickly between um, those with interests, and that's why you're here at this workshop. Um, the plenary session really set the scene in terms of identifying research gaps and identifying the need not just for the research gaps but to, to prioritise in the EU context. Um, we had a, a summary of the regulatory framework um, as it exists in the EU at the moment, the current status of Xylella and Apulia, and the broad areas of research that might be necessary to support the regulatory framework. And there was some interesting discussion on this. There were some, some immediate issues raised. For example, what is the rationale for the, uh, uh, the imposed buffer zone? Uh, the question was raised, what is the likely challenge from, from neighboring uh, Mediterranean countries, which I think is something uh, which will certainly need to be looked at or kept an eye on in the future. What is the challenge to uh, native European flora? This flora has not been exposed to this exotic pathogen in the past, and what is the link between that and the, the known and potential vectors which are endemic in Europe? We have an exotic pathogen formed in association with an endemic uh, vector, vectors, potentially. We had an update on the current situation in Apulia and, and, and now in France, which addressed some of these issues, indicating that these were, shall we say, independent introductions of different subspecies with different hosts. Um, these presentations and, and subsequent discussion raises for me, and I, 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 I state now that I'm giving my personal interpretations and bias on, in these observations, but it raises the question of just what do we mean by a strain, particularly when we're communicating with the public? I mean, are we trying to give the impression that it's some kind of fixed genetic entity? Or do we recognize that it's a sometimes rapidly shifting combination of genes in a population? Uh, I think it's a, it's, it's, it continues to be a serious issue, I think, in these discussions. And sometimes I feel when we say strain, we used to need to use inverted commas. We had a, um, uh, some very informative updates from North and South America, uh, who of course have a much longer experience with the xylella and the disease in a wide range of crops. And the quote that I like is that, don't repeat our mistakes. I think that's a very, very apt comment. But there are some key points, I think, that emerge from this. Um, the basis, the genetic basis for host specificity is largely unknown, and that comes up again in the in the breakout sessions. And many, if not most, xylem feeding insects can transmit depending on the host vector uh, association. Interestingly, it seems that the, uh, the vector species composition that you find on different hosts, they actually vary more geographically than by host. And as we're trying to think about how the current outbreak might extend, both within Italy, France, or wherever, that's something that maybe we need to keep in mind. Both of the, uh, uh, our American speakers stress the key issue of transmission in relation to de disease dynamics. Um, transmission is dependent on inoculum sources, um, shall we say infectious plants, and vector numbers, but taking into account their transmission efficiency and movement potential. And I think the point was made that generally transmission work is underrepresented uh, in the research that's going on. And because of the situation in Europe, is certainly underrepresented at this point in time. 
because transmission integrates, truly integrates, the host vector uh, pathogen interaction. Then two rather different perspectives on research needs were given. Um, the first was given by a representative of, of the farmers group um, and uh, made a plea for an integrated strategy for research taking into account agronomic practices as well as pest management. Um, the Salento open field um, exp laboratory experiments that we've heard about several times during um, this, this workshop perhaps represents an opportunity to evaluate some of these particular options, and we've heard that mentioned several times. The Eurofresco approach, again, which we came back to in this, in, in this last presentation, stressed the importance of coordination and complementarity of research initi initiatives, which I'm sure will be looked at within uh, this new call. Um, but they also emphasize that within that, there, is, there must be some level of focus as well. Which brings me to the breakout sessions. Um, I tried to get uh, to sit in on, on, on all of the, the breakout sessions, and I discussed with uh, the rapporteur some issues that came up, and of course the very valuable um, presentations that have been made since. So if we, um, one comment I would make, I mean, remember that the purpose of the breakout groups was simply to identify gaps and prioritize approaches to uh, research that could provide solutions to those gaps. It wasn't intended that these breakout sessions would actually come up with solutions. It was to identify the gaps and prioritize them. And I think there was a little bit of uh, <laughs> mixing up those two aspects. But the surveillance one stressed why we need surveillance. Uh, can research in surveillance improve identification of targets by targets, uh, the pathogen, um, the vector, the host, the pathways, and the loco locations for, for surveys? What are the best methods and timings? And there's been some international work on this, uh, on, on how best you can uh, optimize your surveillance and sampling activities, which can be learned from. Um, dependent on the... the, the uh, of course, this is dependent on improved detection methods um, for the pathogen and for monitoring of the, uh, uh, of, of the, of the vector, of course. But it also must depend on the uh, knowledge of the underlying pathogen and vector behavior. It was stressed that there's an absolute need to have a clear and unambiguous reason, purpose behind the sampling and the survey that's being done. Nothing. No, no method will suit every given purpose, so it's very, clear, it's very necessary from the beginning to be clear on what your purpose is. That is the message I took from that particular session. In terms of uh, the vector, um, of course, that the work has been started in the, in the EU context on an inventory of the potential vector species, data collection and the coordination um, across Europe that's needed to do that. And again, there, there is work which has started on that. Um, of course, vectors, the, the potential vectors, as, as has been stated many times, are not pest species. So a lot of the work that's been done on, on insects which are pests is much more than that's been done on, on, on some of these um, species that are potential vectors. Um, but there were some uh, areas which were stressed, the rearing of these uh, insects, their reproductive biology, feeding behavior, population dynamics, host preferences. There's a whole set of work that needs to be done, really, in, in the context of the potential European vectors. And also uh, their role within the, the, the whole um, ecosystem. This then really needs to go into the, the studies on transmission, vector infectivity, and some of the aspects relating to uh, dispersal uh, uh, and so forth in relation to disease dynamics. And that, again, links into the aspects of surveillance and detection and monitoring uh, that were brought up in the other groups. So it's a good example of how some of these, uh, these, um, th these different breakout groups do actually link together in, in, in various ways. And other aspects were um, were raised during this discussion uh, in relation to this, effects on biodiversity, if you're going to 
potentially obliterate the whole of these uh, communities, insect communities. I say that in jest. But, um, and of course, using the vector as part of the solution. Um, I think uh, Sandy made a comment at the beginning that one of the purposes of this um, w workshop is to uh, get bright ideas which somebody who's new and naive um, is foolish enough to put forward as a possible solution. Well, we had this solution put forward by a very experienced and, shall we say, not, no longer young uh, member of the, uh, of the audience. Um, then we come to the plants. And, of course, this, this is a difficult area because sometimes it's, it's difficult to say, well, what really is research? What is optimization of a technique or a procedure? And we had some, I'm sure the, the group had some discussion on this, what was research and what was not. Um, but it broadened, it, it really uh, looked at the role of the host, um, breeding for uh, resistance or tolerance, the issue of certification, and where are, what is the research gaps, what, what is the research that could fill some of those, so those aspects. Um, and of course, it's, it's sometimes difficult to be, there are general principles in germplasm collection, plant breeding, that apply almost universally. Uh, but you need to be specific, I suppose, in doing this. And because of the very broad host range, it's very difficult to actually come up with some real specifics. And I think the, um, uh, the group very wisely said that, certainly in terms of the, the germplasm collection and potential breeding, then olive should take the priority in the European context at this point in time. Um, and... Then the other interesting point that was raised up, of course, in most evaluation of germplasm, um, you do need to test in different geographical locations, uh, different environments. It, it's standard practice, but I mean, the constraints on doing that in the Europe, despite the possibilities that were, were, were mentioned, will be quite severe, I would imagine. Okay, then coming on to the actual bacteria, um, again, Given the long history of xylella research in the Americas, what are the real priorities for the EU? Um, what sort of time scale do we need to think about? Um, what is the balance between applied and fundamental science? To what extent do we need to look at the socioeconomic impact? All of these issues were raised uh, during this breakout session. And it seems that in, in the short term, um, typing tools for genetic diversity uh, and the establishment of reference collections re representing that uh, is, is an immediate step forward that would be needed. Uh, in the mid to long term, um, the biotic and in abiotic interactions that are occurring, um, uh, issues relating to host specificity and their response, um, uh, again, um, Bearing in mind the long-term work that's been done on the US, which has so far failed to find any basis, genetic basis for host specificity, um, keep that in mind. But certainly the histopathology um, aspect seems, seems promising. Given the range of um, variation that you get within the different host species um, in, in, in how their histology in the affected areas will, will vary. Um, there was some discussion on, on control within this group uh, and stressing the need to meet farmers' expectations. Physical methods, um, whether we're talking about thermotherapy or cold, uh, to cover both cold and hot um, uh, approaches um, came up. And having a clear idea of the strategies and, and methodologies of application of different tools and their integration uh, also came up within this breakout group. So again, that's what I picked up from the discussions I heard within the breakout groups and the summary that we've heard um, uh, this morning. Of course, there is much more detail that will be in the written accounts that will form part of the, um, the report. And um, it, perhaps we can end up uh, with uh, a more a complete account of, of what, how the report is going to be prepared um, uh, and so forth. But finally, the, the last thing I wanted to mention is that 
we have these very initiatives, we have the existing Ponzi project, we have you fresco initiatives, we have the new call, we have the broader area. Um, there is a need to uh, keep a, uh, some mechanism for coordination across that, to keep a watching brief, um, and to keep a reality check on what's actually being done on, on this future research. And I think uh, Giuseppe Stancinelli uh, mentioned earlier that this is a role that EFSA would be, well, is very willing to take on and is actually being mandated to do. I think that's a very positive way forward in terms of future research. But so I think it would be, be helpful if, if just a few more things could be said about um, what happens next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, for this fairly comprehensive summary of, uh, of, of, uh, of our discussions. Uh, Giuseppe, do you want to say a few words now, or do we pick a few questions or final comments from, from the audience before? I don't see any hand rising, so please, yeah. Giuseppe. You want to come here? Yeah. Which are the which are the next steps. So uh, first of all, uh, we would like uh, next week to publish on the website of EFSA all the abstract and the presentation. So we kindly ask all the speakers if uh, uh, they want to make any change to their presentation, final uh, editorial embellishment to do it uh, uh, by beginning of next week. I think there was a deadline sent to you was the 16, if I remember. So. After that line, we will publish as the presentation as was shown. So if you still want to do some modification, there's still a few days. And also, uh, some presentation were delivered, show presentation in the day of the conference. Uh, I'm not sure we receive all the abstracts. So if you want your abstract to be published, you should also send to you to us by the 16. Uh, we'll try to chase those that are missing, but. Uh, if we don't receive, then we, we don't publish. Hmm. Uh, after that, uh, in, the, in the while, we will go together with the chair and the rapporteur at the session and the overall rapporteur, who is Mike Jagger, in writing the report. And our aim is really to publish as soon as possible to make this available to all participants, to scientific community. Uh, our target is mid-December. Uh, it is a bit ambitious, but we see, we will discuss now with the chair rapporteur, we will continue uh, after this meeting. We'll, there will be a, a short lunch with the chair rapporteurs and uh, also with the speakers that come from uh, uh, outside of EU the, uh, that make all this trip to contribute to our, uh, uh, our workshop. And then we'll have a short meeting with them to define uh, uh, the task and how to proceed. But our aim is to publish the report uh, by mid-December, so that is available for everybody for reading and for uh, also for the preparation of the research calls. Mm. Uh, for the other activity, I think uh, we can say more in the future. So definitely, we had this Monday from DG Research. Uh, yeah, we have the colleague from DG Research uh, in the in the room. Uh, not to stop with this workshop, but to really to to see together uh, with them how to provide a platform for exchanging information uh, uh, among people doing research in Europe, uh, how to make everybody aware of the state of the art on knowledge, uh, where to see in details how to do it, how to cooperate uh, with Ofresco, or with the research institution are conducting research uh, in Europe. We're discussing uh, during the, um, the breakout session, uh, we should also think about how to cooperate with other initiatives, uh, like the Spears Disease uh, Proceedings Conference in California every year, how to make sure that all the information is shared. I think that we have some very good example in the Pears Disease Proceedings in California. They publish all the results of project, positive, negative, so that everything is available for the public, so it's uh, for the researcher. Uh, talk a lot, I think, but I think I, I gave the details enough or something is missing. <laughs> 
No, I think we are. It's it's time for commitment, and uh, and uh, and we have already uh, um, uh, covered uh, the issue of uh, of publishing publishing the report uh, soon enough so that it can be useful uh, for the community in preparing the the, the calls. Uh, I think that uh, the mention of uh, of a platform that uh, that continues to facilitate the exchange within the the community is a strong commitment on our side. Um, I think that uh, what Mike has uh, mentioned is uh, is very important as well. Is that uh, this workshop is probably a, a one-time thing, uh, but there will be a time or so for a reality check, and 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 uh, and uh, that makes me think that uh, it it may be useful that we meet again uh, uh, at at some point uh, to uh, uh, to uh, check what has been uh, what has been done, what uh, is still to be uh, to be done. So. Uh, uh, this workshop is uh, is really a starting point and uh, and certainly not uh, an ending point. Mike, you you have uh, some final comments. I was to give concluding remarks and end of meeting. So, whether it falls to me to officially end the meeting or not, or whether I should pass that back to you as chair, Frank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We were not uh, really prepared for that, obviously. Uh, but uh, okay, I think it's time to uh, uh, to uh, thank you all ag again uh, very much. I would like to thank the uh, the participants of uh, of this workshop for for the uh, um, open uh, uh, discussions for for the engagement. It has been uh, the tremendous uh, tremendous uh, two days. I would like to give a special thank to the EFSA team that uh, has uh, prepared uh, uh, the, the the workshop. Uh, assemble material and uh, assisted in uh, in running the uh, the parallel sessions. They've done a, a tremendous uh, work. I would like also to <laughs> and I would like to so to, to thank one person uh, that you you you've all seen, uh, Vanessa. Uh, she has been uh, instrumental in in organizing this uh, this workshop, and uh, and without her, it would have not been a, a, a success. Uh, so we've said it, uh, presentations and abstracts will be uh, on our website, we, 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 we hope, uh, uh, next week. And, uh, and this, uh, this full report uh, mid-December. Um, you will receive, as uh, all participants, you will receive an email uh, in the coming days uh, with two things. One is a satisfaction uh, uh, survey that we, we ask you to, uh, to fill. Uh, it's a way for us to know uh, if we've done a, a real good job or, or, or not, so, so a good job. Uh, and you could uh, access from there, so a certificate of attendance for those of... It's already online, and Vanessa is there, so it's time to... Okay, the last point is uh, if you need any assistance uh, for uh, transportation to the airport, you can, uh, you can ask to the uh, registration uh, uh, desk. Uh, they would be happy to, uh, to assist you. Uh, I wish you all a safe journey back home. Uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, hopeful that uh, this workshop is the, the starting of, uh, of something and that uh, we will have uh, follow-up activities. Thanks again very much. <laughs>